Greetings. Uh, welcome to Foreign Entanglements. I'm Matt Duss of the Center for American Progress. I'm, I'm really pleased to welcome, for the first time on Blogging Heads, Ambassador Kerry Cavanaugh. Uh, Ambassador Cavanaugh is a 22-year veteran of the State Department. He's been posted in places like Berlin, Rome, Tbilisi, Moscow, and others. Since 2006, Ambassador Cavanaugh has been the director of the Patterson School of International Diplomacy and Commerce at the University of Kentucky. Welcome, Ambassador. Thank you. It's a pleasure to be here today. So we, uh, this is a, a very sad week for America and for the State Department in particular, the, the loss of, of four American diplomats in Benghazi uh, a couple of days ago, along with a number of, of Libyans who were defending the consulate in Benghazi, um, including the American ambassador to Libya, Christopher Stevens. Um, I was uh, actually at the State Department yesterday at a reception in which Sec Secretary Clinton gave some very heartfelt remarks uh, honoring Ambassador Stevens and the others who were killed. The, the Libyan ambassador to America was also there, um, spoke very, very uh, highly um, uh, and emotionally, I thought, about Ambassador Stevens. Um, Secretary Clinton will actually be going uh, to, to uh, Andrews Air Base today to, to receive the bodies of American, the American diplomats. Um, what just just share your perspective on the event, events of the last few days and, and what are the implications and, and what they say about the, the modern era or the, no, the era I'd, we're living through? I'd be glad to uh, and let me start with a few words about Chris Stevens because I think he represents in many ways some of the best that you see in American diplomats serving abroad today. Here, here's an individual who uh, was dedicated and committed to not simply advancing American interests, but really working to improve the cause of democracy around the world. And he had become so enamored with Libya and so committed to how do you make this work that, that to have him be our, our most recent loss in, in this sort of struggle to advance uh, peace and freedom is, is just so tragic. Um, and particularly here in a country where everything he was doing was designed to help advance that country and help benefit the people. And I think we've seen from statements coming out of both the Libyan government, but also out of Benghazi, the acknowledgement that to many Libyans, uh, Chris Stevens was a hero. So mm -hmm. here, here is a hero struck down, working really as hard and as diligently as he could to help advance both the interests of his country and that country. And I, and I think it underscores something that, that often is overlooked in the United States, and it's how many people we have in the American Foreign Service that put their lives on the line in, in for the service of the country. And right. it's understood the armed forces do this. We all right. admit this, acknowledge this uh, repeatedly, but the perception on the Foreign Service is, is often a very different one. It's mm -hmm. of, of a, a, a simpler life, a, a, a very nice life. And I yeah. think the reality in particular in the last several decades, but in some ways always, it has been a different one. And it is, we need people to represent our country in the hardest places. And right. those places, as often as not, are dangerous. Um, it's fortunate we don't often lose people um, it's much rarer, as we know, that we lose ambassadors, though we've lost at least half a dozen since uh, the late 60s. And I think it's known to Americans now, today, because of Chris Stevens and the other three Americans who were killed this week, but also today because of the very vivid memories of our embassies being bombed in Beirut mm -hmm. and Tanzania and mm -hmm. Kenya, that this is a dangerous profession. Yeah, no, I, I was I remarked uh, the other day. I mean, we often see, you know, support our troops is such a common, um, it's a common saying, and, and for good reason. Um, but I think we, we need a stronger sense of support our diplomats um, because the work they do is is not as often dangerous, but very very important. And it is dangerous sometimes, as as we saw tragically this week. Yeah, I've I've often told students that in my diplomatic career. It, it was a fact that I more often wore a Kevlar vest than yeah. I wore a black tie. Yeah, yeah. So this isn't a case of go to formal parties. It's a case right. of being the, the tough mix that's required to advance the causes that the United States supports. 
I mean, it seems over the past, I mean, during the Bush administration, especially, I think, with some of the people who were ad advising George W. Bush, I mean, it, it's, court, it's kind of a trope of, of a lot of the neoconservatives that the State Department is almost always captured by, you know, these diplomats, they go to these countries and they become enamored of their hosts and they start to, to advocate for their host interests over America's interests. And I think it's a really unfortunate and, and possibly dangerous line of argument. Um, that really disrespects the work that, that, that the State Department's diplomats do um, in, in moving America's interests around the world. Are you aware of that line of argument? I mean, what are you, what's your take on I that? I mean, we've seen, we've seen that perception from, from both parties. And, yeah. and, and, and there is a, a sense of a concern on occasion that if a diplomat's too long in a country, they, they become or they seem to be greater advocates of the interests of that country than of their own. I, I think it's it's virtually never true. I, yeah. I think the reality is part of the job of an ambassador in the field is communication. A major job, in fact, is communication. But it's mm -hmm. in both directions. It's communicating our concerns and interests to the host government, but it's mm -hmm. also relaying concerns of the host government back to Washington. And it's also providing the context to Washington policymakers of how things will play in a particular country or what matters in a particular country. And on occasion, that can be mistaken by people who are new to foreign policy as advocating for that country, when in fact, it's laying out very well how effective can this policy line be when these are the local realities. Right. And, and, and I think that part, you know, if you're, if you're a sophisticated consumer, the foreign policy information, you recognize that very quickly. And and anyone new to the game would have a harder time deciphering, oh, that's why he's saying, sure, right. that's a, that policy may fit, and that's our interest, that's what we're going to promote, but if you do it this way, then it'll work in South Africa, but if you do it that way, it will not. It doesn't mean you're advocating for South Africa, or you lost your perspective, but, but it it's part your job, what is going to be the reaction there? How will this play or work there? And, and I think that can be misunderstood. Right. I think that's, you know, that's, there's a similar, this is, that same sort of dynamic is reflected often in, in broader debates we have about foreign policy where, you know, you have, I mean, I just think in order to come up with the correct policy for a given country or a given situation, obviously it helps to know what the person across the table, whether they're an adver adversary or a partner or whatever, what they really want and how they see things. But when you get someone trying to explain to say, okay, what do the Iranians really want? What is the goal of their nuclear program? You often have critics saying, oh, you're, you're defending them or you're advocating for them. And there's, there's often a, a failure to distinguish between explanation and advocacy. Precisely. And, and, and I think, if anything, WikiLeaks showed um, American diplomats were fairly hard hitting in their analysis. Yeah, um, I think right. people were surprised when they had the ability all of a sudden in one fell yeah. swoop to look at a quarter of a million State Department reports, but the, the, the general consensus I heard from journalist friends were the quality of the writing was far better than they ever expected, yeah. right. and, and there was no pulling punches. And in fact, there was a, some public debate on, oh my goodness, how could State Department officers describe the leader of country X this way? Right. When, when, of course, if our president has to deal with that person, our Secretary of State or Secretary of Defense has to deal with that person, you want them to know to the best degree possible exactly what that person's like. Right. What do they right. believe? How do they act? What matters to them? So. You know, you, you get that, and that's part of how you conduct effective diplomacy. I'm, I'm glad you brought up WikiLeaks. I mean, we're like maybe a year, a year and a half out of that huge tranche of documents being made public. What do you see as the impact of that, uh, you know, a year later, a year and a half later? I, I'm hoping the impact, one, was we, we, we tightened up on... <laughs> part of how information was being passed through the Cypernet system, which mm -hmm. is, is where the breach came. Um, the, the, there's a couple realities, I guess I should highlight. One, the State Department, to my knowledge, has never confirmed those are actually our cables and, and probably right. never will. So you can always have the ability to say, well, we don't 
say that necessarily. So you can't worry that's what we really thought about that issue, that person. Mm -hmm. um, it shows, though, the, the dilemma of conducting foreign relations. There are aspects of foreign relations that really do need to be confidential. Um, you cannot conduct all negotiations out in the bright sunshine. And, and I think WikiLeaks highlights the dilemma there. You need to have that information able to be passed and dealt with and used in a, in a way where the privacy of it is, is assured. Um, that means we need better security. Um, it also highlights, and I know last year there was a lot of discussion in a Washington Post series, uh, Top Secret America, a book came out about this, that there's a concern about overclassification in the United States, and, and that's probably accurate as well. So I think WikiLeaks showed that there's a reality, some of that information needs to be private. Um, too much of that information is classified. And, and I would even say, and it's, it's a little heretical perhaps, but the things that are most serious and most classified, none of those were in WikiLeaks. Um, there is a level of documents that the State Department produces that are passed. None of them fell into that group. And, and in part, that leak itself was a result of the greater sharing of information that followed 9-11. It was a desire to give more general State Department reporting a wider readership within the federal government, and it was also a means of providing uh, regular access to State Department reporting to diplomats who had been assigned to unique military units here and there. We've, we've recognized the importance of having greater diplomatic presence with our military as they operate overseas, and part of how we can then get State Department reporting to them was through the military SIPRNET system, and, and that's where that uh, security breach occurred. So moving back to uh, Benghazi um, and, and Cairo, um, which is where the two uh, the, the two demonstrations first started, both at both of those at the embassy in Cairo and the consulate in Benghazi. And now yes. we, we're, we've seen demonstrations um, in Yemen. There were some demonstrations or riots. We would call them in, in Lebanon. I was, we were just reading about this morning, uh, including the I guess the destruction of a KFC. I don't know what message that is supposed to send. Um, but you know, a lot of this, you know, it's important not to put too much blame on a dumb YouTube video featuring a very, very poorly made anti-Muslim film. Um, you know, but at the very least, this does seem to have provided some of the fire or the kindling for for some of these demonstrations. Um, and I think there's, I mean, it, what what do you think this says about you know the the, the the era of technology we're living in, where you know. People, you know, extremists in these countries can can kind of just start pointing to these things and, and, and rile people up. How does the State Department, how does American diplomacy really deal with that? I, I think it's very difficult, to, and I think it's amplified by the high-tech era we live in, but it mm -hmm. certainly existed before, too. Um, you, if you go all the way back to World War One, there were rumors about uh, atrocities the Germans committed or Belgians mm -hmm. committed that, that, that fed uh, fervor for war. So you have the ability to do that without technology. I think the danger now is technology provides an easy handle. And, and it's easy for people in both directions who want to rile or who wish to encourage people to demonstrate to, to take advantage of that. For the United States, I think there's a bit of a quandary. We are very firm in our support of Internet freedom, and we have enshrined in our Constitution a very broad freedom of speech. Um, our intent and the government's intent all along has been to, to allow the greatest possible free, freedom of speech, and, and not simply in our country, but around the world. And it means you have the ability of, of hate groups, of extremist groups, to take advantage of high technology and and put their messages out there. Um, I don't know that it would be accurate to say at all that the demonstrations, and today they've spread literally from Morocco all the way to Bangladesh, 
are tied to people so much having seen this video is yeah. people having heard there is such a video. Right. And, and it also means then there is an underneath problem, and I think it deals with upsetness among large populations over the course of American policy in the region, or mm -hmm. the course of their own government's policy, or mm -hmm. their own economic situation. I think we saw even yesterday some of the demonstrations in Cairo as they continued around the American Embassy were clearly dealing more with grievances protesters had with the Egyptian police right. from the past more than a video produced in California that most of those people, if not all of those people, hadn't even seen. So right. we, we have both the pretext for the demonstration and then I think the realities of why we're getting these demonstrations. But, but, the, but the internet throws a, a funny piece into this because it does allow for that information to be disseminated instantaneously everywhere. Now I would yeah. add, the internet adds a piece in the other direction. Yeah. Um, we saw in the demonstrations in Iran um, several years ago uh, when uh, Neda Agan Sultan was shot mm -hmm. and uh, died during a demonstration over uh, presidential elections, mm -hmm. um, the images of her death were flashed via cell phone around the world instantaneously and rallied thousands to be more engaged in democratic efforts. So the, mm -hmm. uh, the internet has the ability to amplify in both directions, mm -hmm. but, but it becomes a challenging media to handle in both diplomatic terms and I think even in journalistic terms. It's, it, it, it just presents difficulties that we've yet to figure out how to properly deal with as, as governments, as societies. Um, there's a, and, and, and it really highlights, and I think we saw this this past week, the need not to be too quick to judgment. Um, here there's demonstrations over a film that has no sanction by the U.S. government. Mm -hmm. None of these type films would ever be supported by the U.S. government. And, and, and we have reactions that are based on things in the internet that again, the, the, the timelines are confused, the information is confused, mm -hmm. um, accuracy of things on the internet can always be in question. It was a very prominent uh, situation about two years ago where in Syria we were concerned that uh, the uh, a blogger, a very active and popular blogger, a gay girl in Damascus, yeah. uh, people thought had been arrested and maybe was right. going to be tortured by the government. And then it turned out not only was it not a gay girl, it wasn't gay, it wasn't girl, and he wasn't in Damascus. Right. It was a U.S. Uh, citizen who was on vacation in Scotland yeah. and had not been to Syria at all, but was very excited about democracy. He was a very good writer. He was writing mm -hmm. compelling stories of eyewitness accounts that right. were not real. And yeah. how do you, as a, as a citizen, interpret that when you read it in the paper? How do you, as a government official, deal with that kind of information when the accuracy is hard to check? becomes a challenge because to take the time to check the accuracy invites a criticism you're not being proactive enough on the policy. Mm -hmm. and, and I think how we find that right balance and that right balance is both as a, a, for officials, for politicians, and for citizens is, is going to be tricky. It may get worse. Um, I'm curious, and, and you know, of course, please be as diplomatic as, as you feel you need to be or, or, or don't need to be here. I mean, what is your your take on the back and forth between the Obama, the, between the Romney camp and, and the administration, um, Mitt Romney's criticisms of the Cairo embassy's tweets um, and, and, its, and its criticisms of the administration's broader response? I don't want to get deep into that because I think that's not the important issue that we face now. Yeah. I think much more is the tragic loss of four Americans mm -hmm. serving their country abroad. But I, I think it highlights that concern about too quick reaction to things you see on the Internet. Mm -hmm. And it highlights the concern I just raised about how you engage the Internet both in, as consumers, people, but for governments. As a, as a means of spreading information. 
there's been a lot of criticism about, well, tweets from our embassies, and, and there's been a push for several mm -hmm. years now to have a greater social media stance and diplomacy. And if you think of it from a public diplomacy angle, how do you get information out to people? That makes sense. If, mm -hmm. if, if, if societies are young, and many of the countries that we worry about the most have predominantly young societies, and societies are, are tied into this new electronic age, and, and you can find very few landlines in a lot of Middle East countries, and cell phones in everyone's hands, then the idea of moving to Facebook, to Twitter, to, to mm -hmm. LinkedIn, you name it, Pinterest even, you know, if you can think of a social media site that may help you get your message out there, there's a thought that's where the audience is. The yeah. dilemma is governments and diplomacy are not suited particularly well to those media. Um, you cannot state in a definitive effective way American foreign policy in 140 characters. Yeah. No, no matter how good a, a Twitter user you are, your tweets can't have the nuance, the, the texture and the detail required to be effective government policy. Um, they may be interesting. Um, I commented on one in California not long ago that the United Kingdom sent out after a meeting with the United States and said, special relationship even more special. <laughs> yeah, what does that mean? You know, why why even tweet it? Well, you tweet it because you want to say the United States and the United Kingdom are still close. Sure, yeah. but it's kind of trite. It's kind of folksy, and it's kind of what Twitter seeks. It rewards that kind of tweet. It doesn't yeah. reward two hours with Obama on principal issues. No, that's not what people want to read on Twitter. They want to read that. Maybe they want to read some controversy back and forth, but they don't want to see the formal years of government. And I think the dilemma when we have officials responding to tweets, that's what you get. Mm -hmm. um, if, you, if you have people storming the walls of your embassy and you only have seconds to write a message and you send it out on Twitter, and that may be a good thing to do if it gets to a lot of people at the right time, it's going to be short, it's going to be sweet, and it's not going to have a lot of the detail. So let's, um, looking at the, the Middle East and, and Libya and, and, and Egypt, and especially those two countries, I mean, we've got countries where old, more authoritarian regimes have been removed. We've got two new governments um, trying to find their feet. Um, just a lot of a lot of transition going on. Now, you you uh, opened, I believe, America's embassy in Georgia, in Tbilisi, in 1992. Um, I'm curious what I you did, see. And, and, and that was during the Civil War. Right. So, so that was also in a violent time and a time of people. And, yeah. and one of the things there, and, and in fact, we, we ran the same risk of what we've seen in Libya this week, is new governments and their understanding of what's required diplomatically and their mm -hmm. ability to do it. Um, and, and it brings up, I think, what is really sort of the pressing issue of this week, and it's on a lot of people's mind, minds at least, and that's embassy security. Um, so when we opened the American embassy in Georgia, we had no brains. Um, we had no guards. We relied 100% on the host government to provide security for those diplomatic operations. Hmm. And we were worried about that. Now, it was a new country and a new embassy, so it's a little different there. So we brought in a minimal number of personnel. Um, I had them under a curfew. That, that wasn't too hard because soon there was a curfew anyway that you ran the risk of being shot if you were outside after 6 p.m. And you know, we would practice the best security we could. That said, outside my window, parked every day, was a tank, not necessarily a friendly tank, and outside the windows of where all of our staff lived, there was machine gun battles every night till one or the other party was killed. Um, it was a dangerous environment, but we had to rely on the government to provide us, and I remember 
vividly a dinner with uh, Edward Chevardante after we had just opened the embassy mm -hmm. at his home, and it was late and past the curfew time, and we had to go back, and we asked that they call the checkpoints and alert them we were coming, and they laid out to us they didn't have the ability to do that, and their wow. assumption was the American flag on the front of the car would deter people from shooting us. Um, that was a great assumption, not a great uh, exercise of the requirement to provide protection for us. Um, right. Fortunately, we're talking today, and obviously we were not shot at that night, mm -hmm. but, but it highlights the danger. And, and I think this is a piece of the discussion that came out this week that people do need to understand. It, it's not an issue of how could the government put people in Libya or Egypt or, or Paris or London, for that matter, and not provide them adequate protection. You could never provide adequate protection. Um, we have a handful of Marines in embassies, and, and their job is actually primarily to protect classified information. It's an mm -hmm. ancillary thing that they protect Americans who are working there. But they, they are at best a slow things down a little bit force for the host mm -hmm. government to respond. If there's yeah. 2,000 people demonstrating outside your embassy or consulate, there is no force that could hold them at bay. And as we've seen in the Middle East in particular, a crowd of 2,000, if, if it's riled, can very quickly become a crowd of 100,000. Yeah. Um, we have to rely on host governments. And, and I think that's the message that was made clear this week by President Obama when he spoke to the leaders both in Libya and in Egypt. Um, this is a primary responsibility for you. Right. And, and, and when it fails, uh, you get disasters. You get the right. deaths that we see this week. You, you get the hostage taking that we saw in the past in Iran. And the ramifications of that can be enormous. Even to this day, part of the difficulty in our establishing better let alone normal diplomatic relations with Iran, is that legacy of the hostage crisis. Right. Um, it's very important countries do this. And, and it isn't just for the United States. It's all countries for all the countries that are represented there. And, mm -hmm. and there's not a choice in Washington, and can never be, we'll only send the diplomats to places that are always safe. Mm -hmm. and, and in fact, we send the diplomats to places where it's too dangerous to send the American military. Um, we send them everywhere. America is a global power with global interest, and we really require our people everywhere. And, 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 and that's often lost on some citizens, and citizens who travel understand it, I think, much better. And it's if you're in Bangladesh and you're in trouble, you're very glad there's an American embassy there. And if you're in the middle of a war zone and you're in trouble, you're very glad there's an American embassy there because you were part of the interest that those embassies protect. It is helping those citizens when they are overseas, and you can find Americans everywhere. So those are all excellent, excellent points. Um, just if we can stay on Georgia for a moment, I, I, that's, that's, sure. I'm kind of interested in you know. Do you see any lessons um, that are transferable from Georgia, from the work that you did as Georgia was moving from its you know its Soviet past slowly toward toward a more democratic Georgia? Uh, it's still in that transition, I, I would argue. Um, but when you look at Egypt, when you look at Libya, do you do you see any any lessons that can that you can that, that are applicable here? I, I see the one that uh, one is the warning. It's going to take a while. Yeah. Um, I think there's a desire often on the part of the West to see quick results. Um, these things don't happen mm -hmm. quickly. It takes a long yeah. time for democracy to take hold in a society. And, 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 and that can be despite having some of the best leaders. Um, we were very excited in the United States when uh, Edward Shevardnadze was made president of Georgia. Here was a champion of democracy. His, his performance in Moscow during the, 
the final days of the Soviet Union mm -hmm. was just exemplary, standing up for the importance of citizens being able to dictate and direct where government went and, and, and not a more centrally directed top-down system. And, and he moves to Georgia. Um, yeah. So he starts working on that. But he found the problems of corruption in Georgia were just unfathomable and, and very hard to surmount. So it took years and years and years, and in the end, he, he was not able to achieve that. Um, we do not have perfect democracy in Georgia today, that's for sure, but they're moving on that path. But at this point, this is after decades. Mm -hmm. I think what we will see in Egypt is going to take quite a while. That said, there's a difference in Egypt as well, and that is we have had a much closer long-term relationship with right. the Egyptian people, Egyptian society, Egyptian military, and a lot of leaders in Egypt. Um, doesn't mean there aren't new leaders coming to fore we haven't had enormous contact with. There are, but I think there's a bit more there to build on. And, mm -hmm. and I, my hope is in Egypt, We'll, we'll see that taking hold more quickly. And, and a lot of Egyptians have had greater contact with the United States in an even more concrete way. And we mm -hmm. saw this during the fall of Mubarak, where the American military was able to act in, I think, the ultimate diplomatic fashion. Um, mm -hmm. We had officers who had served at war colleges with Egyptian officers who had participated in exercises with Egyptian officers, contact their counterparts and simply say, be professional. And I think the understanding there was professional men, professional soldiers don't shoot their own citizens. Yeah. Um, that relationship crafted over decades um, played a role there. Well, that relationship's still there. A lot of those people are still in positions of authority. So there's more of an understanding, I think, than was in Georgia at that time, of the direction these things need to go and a better understanding of what, how to get there I think, and what's at the end. All right, well, thanks so much for, for joining me today, Ambassador. I really in, enjoyed the conversation. No, it was my pleasure and, and good talking with you, Matt. All right. Uh, thanks, everyone, for watching, and remember to visit our Facebook page, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.